Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for tuning in for Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's August Virtual Artist in Residence Q&A. My name is Jay Zeller. I work at SHI, and it is my pleasure to introduce Stacy Williams, a Tlingit native born into the raven side of the Tehwedi under the dog salmon clan. Raised in Ketchikan, Alaska, it's also where she continues to practice her arts and teaching. Student under Holly Churchill, Dorisa Jackson, Diane Douglas Willard, and many other talented weavers. She's worked hard to study multiple disciplines of weaving. As an instructor, she instills hope in each of her students that the arts will go on, as well as works to maintain the delicate balance of traditional knowledge and contemporary growth of the culture. Her baskets and pieces can be seen on display in the Ketchikan Museum's collection, as well as Crazy Wolf Studios and in private collections. Stacy's artwork can also soon be purchased in the Sea Alaska Heritage Store online. All purchases support both the artist and SHI art programming that helps the community and keep our ancient art practices alive. If you have any questions, please type them in the comments and I'll read them off to our guest. Stacy, thank you for joining us again today. Thank you, Jay. It is a pleasure to be speaking with you again. I'd like to acknowledge that in this virtual setting, I am speaking and sharing from Ketchikan, Alaska, the traditional homelands of the Sanyaquan and the Tontaquan people. My name is Stacy Williams and I am Clinkett of the Raven Dog Salmon. My home has always been right here in Ketchikan and it's where I plan to stay. Both my parents were raised here and it is the home of my grandfathers as well. Paternally, the late Chief Joseph C. Williams Sr. and maternally, the late Edwin C. DeWitt. Um, I'd like to just dive in if you're ready. Yes, we are. First up, um, I would like to ask, how many weaving styles do you know? Oh, that's a tough question right out of the gate. Uh, you know, in working with cedar bark and spruce root, there are several different types of starts and endings, as well as different forms of twining that can be implemented throughout the body of the basket, hat, or other pieces. In textiles, there is Raven's Tail, which I have a lot of fun with. It's what you might call a somewhat relaxing challenge, uh, whereas Chill Cat, that to me is more of an active challenge. Both have their own merits, and I feel it's really hard to compare those two. Throw that in with the cedar bark, and your fingers will just never sit still. All right, my next question is, which style was the first one that you learned? Oh, um, I believe in terms of weaving, I learned basic twining and plating by using a technique called rough like the skin on a frog's back, which is a Haida technique that my, um, my lovely teacher, Holly Churchill, had worked with me on. Um, I was working on a hat with her in a youth class. Uh, and while doing that project, I also learned a lot about adding warps, the uh, vertical pieces, and dividing those to make the, ha the hat uh, fan out. Is it more difficult to learn other styles of weaving after you've got one down or like would you find yourself starting with one style and accidentally shifting into another one? There, there are times that I would be working in one style, move to another and have to remind my fingers of what they are supposed to be doing. Uh, usually I like to stick with whatever the new style is until I'm comfortable with it, whether that be a four-way or six-way braid, whether that be, you know, false embroidery. I like to stick with that until I um, really start being comfortable with what I'm doing. Uh, what can be difficult is teaching more than one technique or style in the same class, um, but I'd say it's far more difficult to force a different twine on a student um, than what comes more naturally to them. So oftentimes in classes, you'll find many different types of twining all happening at the same time. Interesting. Um, what is your favorite thing about each style? Well, cedar bark has a certain structure about it. It's very pleasing to work with. Um, spruce root has a certain strength to it that really can only be admired, but both styles of making baskets is something that I, that I always enjoy doing. Uh, Raven's tail is very soft and flexible. It can be a, a more forgiving weaving, and mathematically, Raven's tail just makes sense. Uh, Chill Cat is uh, so full of braids that my fingers can keep very busy. Uh, I also just am in awe of how the ancestral weavers had been able to create the beautiful and striking circles and curves that is in Chilcat weaving. 
we have our first uh, comment question here. Wonderful. Um, how did you become an instructor and how many years have you been weaving? Well, I started out in, um, I would say high school, uh, at the Ketchikan High School, there was a child psychology and child careers program there um, that was successful for several years. And within those classes, I was tasked with going out and teaching in the world. It was a very hands-on experience to go into each of the preschools in the town uh, within the child psychology class. And then in child careers, you were really paired up with um, one to two students that you would visit four out of the five days a week. You'd spend an entire hour with your student getting to know their grade level, getting to know what they're working on, things like that. Um, that really is where my interest in teaching um, was solidified. Uh, several years later, I was able to, you know, outside of high school, I was hired as a paraprofessional for the Ketchikan Gateway Borough School District. And I, I worked with um, one student in particular, but you know, you always have, you always have several, if not a full classroom. Uh, but I worked with one student in particular um, for that year. And I just found it to be so rewarding. I won't you know, say that it was enjoyable every moment of every day, but it was one of the most worth it experiences. Um, with that, I moved on to becoming the, um, formerly a tour guide, but then a program assistant at Ketchikan Museums, um, mainly placed over at the Totem Heritage Center where I had the lovely honor of taking many different grade levels and many different groups of people on different tours. So I would take, you know, second grade from Fawn Mountain Elementary or I'd take third grade from the charter school or I'd take, you know, a class from the high school and we'd go around and we'd look at the totem poles. We'd look at the baskets in the display case, the hats on the stands. And I, I remember there was one, one fairly special experience. Um, there was a teacher whose hat was actually on display in the museum. So her students were able to go in and say, oh my gosh, miss, you know, I'm not gonna call her out, but you know, miss whoever, that's your piece. You made that, that's so exciting. And just to hear that engagement, that connection, you know, that was really what I, I wanted to do was I wanted to make those connections for those students. Um, so after leaving my position as program assistant at Ketchikan Museums, I was able to kind of move into a contracted cultural bearer position um, with the cultural coordinator at the Ketchikan Gateway Borough School District. And we do interventions um, in the classrooms. We bring in materials, we bring in projects, we bring in songs, we bring in stories, we bring in all sorts of resources that you can think of. And we try to make those connections. Uh, so Really, my, my interest in teaching began in high school and has continued on until, well, now a decade later, I'm out of high school and I, I get to teach. So that's, that's pretty wonderful. That's amazing. And I definitely agree that teaching, if it's your calling, it's, it's one of the most rewarding things. Um, my next question is, uh, how long has it taken to learn each style? Can you give us an average? An average. Okay, well, each one is different and not terribly comparable. Um, I think I picked up cedar weaving fairly quickly, uh, and each technique used in cedar would be a challenge at first, uh, but then once I got it down, it would be cemented in my head. Um, you know, I also have a very wonderful and generous basketry teacher. Uh, Raven's Tale, I was able to learn from a book with Cheryl Samuels, um, and with my previous knowledge in weaving baskets, it was fairly easy to understand. Um, after I got through a few small items like double-sided pouches, I worked my way up into making the larger pouch uh, that I, um, I think I showed it last week on uh, the, the first Friday, but I think people like seeing things anyway, so I'll just bring it out, um, that I was able to make this uh, in, a, in a class where there were other students that were doing a similar or same pattern, um, but it, it's two-sided. But what was really interesting about the contemporary piece um, that is this pouch is that you wove it all in one long piece and then folded it in half and, and made a made a pouch. Um, so that was that was a pretty wonderful um, experience to be able to take that class uh, and create something that you know I otherwise um, would have struggled with um, by myself. You know um, I with with Raven's Tale um, 
you know, I find the math and the repeating patterns to be very pleasing to the eye, especially when they are executed with patients. Uh, patience is really an important um, thing to remember uh, within all the textiles and within basketry and with any sort of weaving. Um, but you know, also chill cat was a challenge because, but because of the work that I had done previously with Raven's Tail and basketry, I, I would say that I caught on quicker than if I, I hadn't had done that. I am also grateful to have a wonderful teacher there too. So shout out to the teachers. <laughs> We have another comment question. What cultural permissions are needed to make different pieces of weaving? That is an excellent question. Um, you know, there are quite a few books um, that have been published on basketry and on techniques and on designs. Um, I would say that there are I kind of relate it back to the stories or to fishing lands or to harvesting grounds, things like that, that way back in the day, um, these places were owned and it wasn't necessarily an individual ownership, but these were clan properties or these were tribal properties. And to go to a fishing ground that wasn't yours, well, that was definitely frowned upon. However, there are those fishing grounds that are considered more or less for everybody. Um, similar with the weaving and with stories, um, you know, there are those stories that seem to transcend the nations and they, at this point, really belong to us all. Um, you know, there is that origin within the story of where it came from and you always acknowledge that and you always honor that. But at this point, there are some stories that have transcended the clink at the height of the Simshian or that we have a similar story. And that way it, it, in that way, it belongs to us all. Uh, with weaving techniques, there are certain designs that I would classify as um, being protected or more off limits because they are uh, protected techniques that need to be passed down in the correct way. Uh, similar to when you might wear a clan crest that is not yours at a potlatch or at some feast. It's your responsibility to take note and to represent to everybody that that's not your crest, but that you have permission and you have the permission from so-and-so to be wearing that crest. Um, you know, perhaps you have an auntie or an uncle on the opposite side that is just so thrilled to have you involved in the culture they really want you to wear something to represent and although it's not your clan maybe you're a raven and you're wearing something eagle you need to represent you know where you got that from where you have those those permissions uh, there are certain techniques like you know basic twining is something that i feel transcends even just the the northwest coast nations but to the world um, one of the most important lessons that my teacher has impressed upon me is that weaving belongs to us all not necessarily that every type of weaving is just okay to go and do, but that at some point in each one of the people watching here, at some point in your line, there is weaving. There's no way to get around it. That's just how the world came together at some point, whether it was, you know, thousands of years ago or tens of thousands of years ago, you know, who knows? And, you know, you could do a lot of research into that. It's kind of an endless rabbit hole. Um, but I would say, uh, just to kind of wrap that up, that it's really important to figure out where these designs come from. If it's a clinket design, if it's a Haida design, if you're doing Simshian, you know, it's really important to know where it comes from. If you're unsure, there's plenty of places to reach out. You know, there's um, groups on Facebook that you can, you know, join and get some knowledge from other people. There's museums to contact. I just contacted the Alaska State Museum myself this week and said, hey, I'd really like to come and research your basket collection. And they said, hey, well, we have a basket collection, so that's wonderful. Uh, and, you know, we're in the, the talks of trying to, to plan that out of how I can go study and research those. And when I research, I will be taking pictures, I'll be taking notes, personal notes for myself, um, you know, identifying those designs and where they come from. As long as you're honoring where something is coming from, and you're not trying to, I would say, pass it off as your, your own invention, um, you can be in a, a somewhat safer place. What a wonderful answer to a great question. Um, uh, the next comment question we have is, uh, how do you get ready to set up for a new project? 
Oh, that is a great question. Um, in something that I have actually been waffling over for the last several years of creating new projects. What I like to do is make sure that I have more than enough material. Things can go wrong. You know, perhaps some life event comes up and you are unable to get back to your project. Maybe something happened to it, you know, everything forbid that maybe your dog gets into your project or something like that. You know, your dog ate your homework. That's totally an excuse. And it has happened in classes that I've been in, unfortunately. Um, but you want to make sure that you have enough material. Um, that's really the main part, because if you have, let's say, um, 100 yards, but you only need 75 of it, well, save that 25, because what if a warp breaks? What if your weavers run out? What if something, unfortunately, molds? Um, you don't want to have a big change in your project because the material has changed. It's like switching from, you know, I don't know, a rose art crayon to a Crayola, the two reds are not gonna be the same. And that's, that's a really important thing as well. For setting up, I like to make sure that I have my little tool bag um, and my tool bag will include most importantly, a sharp um, usable paring knife. Um, I know most weavers like to just get those really cheap little dollar store ones, they work fine or you can have some fancier knife. Um, but really what is important is that you have a knife that fits in your hand, has a sheath, and that you know how to use it. Uh, the next important thing in my bag is either a spray bottle or a large blunt um, big eye needle. Uh, those are some important things. And also, you know, a good sharp pair of scissors. Other tools can vary. Um, and I would say that not all the tools in the world are necessary to start a basket, um, but certainly some tools can make it easier. I know that uh, some people have used um, a crochet hook to try to get their weave to go down the basket. Um, just for example, I'll bring out this basket here. When you end a basket, um, you're going to be tucking your last two weavers down into your stitches. Sometimes if you have a larger basket, obviously a crochet hook wouldn't really do too much um, in this small one, but let's say you have a large, uh, like what I was saying last week, the five gallon bucket basket. Um, you know, that crochet hook can help you get in between those, those tighter stitches. Um, another knife is oftentimes helpful. Um, sometimes I like one knife for processing cedar and another knife um, for processing spruce root. It really is um, dependent on um, what your what your preference 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 is. Excuse me, um, but you know, just make sure you have everything to start off with. It can be very frustrating when you get to a place of your basket and you're on a groove and everything's clicking, and then you have to stop and prep material. That can be really frustrating. So prep early, prep often, prep fully and then be on your way. Another great reply to an <laughs> awesome question. Uh, our next comment question is, are there artists that you haven't studied with yet that you would love the opportunity to learn from, or if not artists, specific starts or endings you would like to learn? Well, there is a, um, a number of endings, you know, there is a finite number. You can't just, you know, do all the different endings in the world or else it wouldn't stay Northwest Coast basketry. Um, I'm sure my, my teachers can correct me a little bit later if I am incorrect here, uh, but I believe there's somewhere around 12 or 13 endings in Northwest Coast basketry, just kind of generally. Um, there's, you know, many different techniques of doing uplift design and uplift design. Um, oh, I, I do have a little example here. Um, uplift design, uh, this is an unfinished project. So excuse me for showing you behind the scenes, um, but this is a little bun cover. So it's kind of like a mini hat, um, but you can see I have all these pieces sticking out right here. Um, and these are the uplift that causes um, literally the weave to be lifted up off the, the project so that you can see a design. And so in here, um, I believe I had started kind of doing a little zigzag and then a, a, like a lightning or a, um, and then a diamond pattern, things like that. Um, I messed up on my count on that one. Um, it does happen. I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be, I am still a student. And so I do need to take that project back and kind of restart my design. Um, so uplift is definitely something that I would like to continue working on and continue improving. 
and I feel that it's a technique that will always need improvement. It's really a manipulation of the material. It's a manipulation of mathematics, because if you think about it, when you're doing an uplifted design on a hat and it fans out, you're adding numbers into your count. And so you have to make sure that those numbers add up correctly uh, when, you, when you go to implement the, the design. As far as teachers go, I have been very, very fortunate in my experiences of working at the museum, of working with the school district, of working um, you know, with my neighbors and things like that. Um, but you know, I would say that each of my teachers I would like to work with them more. Um, you know, as far as teachers go, I have Holly Churchill, I have Dorica Jackson, I have Diane Douglas Willard, uh, Evelyn Vanderhoop, Catherine Rousseau, Barbara Pierce, um, Wayne Hewson, Fred Trout. You know, there has been many, many artists that have been involved in my journey. And I just wish for as much time with each of them as, as time allows. Um, you know, that's a, a pretty special thing. And I did mention some carvers in there just to clarify, I don't claim to be a carver, uh, though I have made several pieces. Um, I have, you know, carved a bowl, carved some paddles, um, done some basic relief carving on panels and things like that. Um, Everett Athorpe uh, let me uh, paint with him one time on a very large wolf panel. Uh, he kept me on the tail, um, but I was just fine with that, learning the, the techniques of painting onto cedar onto raw cedar there. So that's what I would say, you know, cherish the mentors and the teachers that you have and make sure that you spend as much time with them as you can. Thank you very much. Our next question is, what are some of the designs you've made? Have you made your own designs or recreated older ones? Uh, mostly I try to recreate older ones. Uh, I believe I have gone rogue a little bit here and there when it comes to um, endings. <laughs> um, there has been a time or two where I've had to just kind of um, fib something up a little bit and you know those aren't my most prized baskets but typically they're sampler baskets where I do so much on the basket that I run out of warp at the end and then I have to do a cutoff ending and then you know that's just how it goes. Um, here is one such basket. Um, this one, um, the, the green material that I had gotten for this basket um, was by one of those teachers, uh, Diane Douglas Willard I mentioned earlier. Um, but if you take a look um, right here, this is a six way braid um, that goes around and is kind of lifted up off of the um, basket itself. Um, this right here is a false embroidery. Uh, this right here is a wild strawberry pattern, followed by more false embroidery to even it out. Um, and then another strand of color just here at the top. Um, and this really was not a, a traditional piece. Um, this is what you would call a, a little sampler basket so that you can try out techniques before you put it on the actual project that you're trying to work on. Um, there was another um, somewhat, um, I would say, kind of unconventional uh, thing that I did on this basket here. Uh, this one is a rattle top basket. Um, however, I made a few mistakes. One, I made the chamber for the rattle a little bit small. Um, and so it doesn't um, have as fine of a sound. I wonder if I kind of yeah, you can't really hear that. There's beads inside, so you can't really hear it. Um, but I did a four-way um, twine around the edge here to make a defined um, turning point for the, the edge of the lid. And a four-way twine isn't really, um, I guess, the most traditional thing. But I really wanted that color to pop out every other strand. So if I did it as a three-way, it would be, you know, two light strands, one red, two light, one red. And that wasn't what I had wanted the basket to look like. Um, so that's one such example. Um, another such example, um, um, and I don't know if this will be a question later, but uh, this is my first basket and we're always welcome to come back to it, but this has a little bit more of a sound. So that's, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, and that was the, the first basket that I created. Um, it was not my first weaving. Um, I believe I mentioned last week that my first weaving was actually the hat. And I think I mentioned that earlier working with Holly Churchill, um, but this was my very first um, basket. So that's, that's wonderful. That's great. And yes, the, your first project and first basket was, was the question. So thank you for showing us. Um, 
The next question we have is, which materials are hardest to care for? Oh, probably spruce root. Um, spruce root has a um, very particular nature about it. Um, when you work with spruce root, you need to wet it, um, but you can't just use any water that you choose. The minerals in the water will actually change the color of the spruce root. And when working with roots, it's um, you're really trying to go for the brightest, whitest, best material that you can produce from having gathered, cooked, and, and stripped and processed the roots. So I really try to not let the colors of my roots change. And in order to do that, you have to collect, um, maybe not here, uh, you know, like in the city or in any of the other big cities, but if you were to be working, you know, a little bit outside in a more rural community, um, you could collect rainwater and you could, you know, wet it with that. But if that's not available, uh, then, you know, head on down to the store and get some distilled or, you know, get some, um, some clean water. And that way you can, you know, keep your roots nice and pretty and, and bright. Um, the other thing with roots is that it, um, I'll, I'll do a little comparison. In the time that it takes me to round up a bag full, like a, a large bag full of cedar over the course of a day or two, that is going to be my supply for, let's say a hat or maybe an entire classroom full of baskets for some littles. Um, in that amount of time, I will end up with one sandwich baggie or one brown paper sack full of roots. It's a very big difference in terms of the time constraints. And what you'll find is that if you go look in the galleries, if you go look in the shops and find an actual spruce root basket, and if you find an actual, you know, cedar, cedar bark basket, the prices will be significantly different. And, you know, just make sure that you understand how much extra work goes into working with spruce roots than to working with cedar. Very fascinating. Um, that kind of leads into our next comment question, which are what are the best practices for caring for materials? Always make sure everything is dry, dry, dry before you put it away. Um, do some testing in the room that you're going to be storing it in. You know, some people will be oh so sad because they stuck it out in the garage or out in the shop. And then, you know, we live in a rainforest. Moisture and humidity is a real factor. So, you know, maybe get a small dehumidifier. You know, you can order them online. They're not too expensive anymore. And just test to see how much water is coming out of that room on a daily basis. If there's a lot, you might wanna rethink how you're storing your cedar. Um, there are ways that you can, you know, hang it up on a clothesline or maybe you let it dry partway outside before you coil it up, um, but find what works for you. It's going to be different along the coast depending on, you know, where you're getting your cedar, you know, close to the coast or up in the mountain or farther north, farther south, um, you know, different times of the season throughout the spring and summer are going to determine if your basket is going to, you know, be created with nice, pretty, wonderful material, or if you're not going to have a basket because your material molded. And if your material molds, um, I'll just take a moment to say that um, we get all of these materials from the land that provides for us. And in the forest, um, you know, getting that cedar, it's really important to be grateful and thankful for what it is that you're able to do and that it has survived this long. And with that being said, um, any material that molds or is deemed unusable, even if it's just the clippings at the end of your basket, put them outside, give them back to the forest, give them back to the earth. And if you're unable to do that, um, maybe have a little fire you know, and give it back that way. Um, obviously mold is not something that you just wanna go throw out in the forest. So I, I urge people to have those, those special ceremonies. Um, just like, you know, Sea Alaska will be having this afternoon. I believe that was scheduled um, this afternoon. Um, and, you know, it's really important to connect to those ceremonies. And ceremony doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be, um, but ceremony can be whatever it is that means to you. 
Thank you very much. Um, another question we have is, uh, what is the farthest you've traveled to harvest materials? And related to your answer here, is it important for weavers to know how to harvest and process or prepare their own material? Well, um, you know, I think I, um, in terms of traveling north, so I'll answer that question first. Um, I traveled as far north as Juneau and then Yakutat. Um, I was an apprentice um, to Holly Churchill at the, um, the I think it's called the Turn Festival, the, the Bird Festival up in Yakutat um, that happens in the springtime. And I was able to go up there with her and apprentice to her under, um, under the, the subject of spruce roots. And so she really um, was a, a generous teacher in you know, sharing her knowledge of how do you find the right place to gather roots? You know, how do you find the right tree? How do you make sure that everything's you know, all okay? And then from that, she actually had me turn around and teach it that very same week um, to a, a group of, of younger students that were involved in the youth program at the Turn Festival. And I would say that we had a blast. Um, you know, if any, of, if any of those guys ever watch this, you know, I just want to say to them that it was such an honor to be able to come to their community in Yakutat and to be able to share with them the knowledge that my teacher shared with me and that, you know, years ago, people there had, had shared for a while as well. Um, as, um, and then the second part of the question was, if you wouldn't mind reminding me, <laughs> Is it important for weavers to know how to harvest and process or prepare their own material? Okay, so for that question, I would say as an eventual goal, I don't believe that harvesting or processing the materials is a beginner's task. Um, it should be done more at an intermediate, if not an advanced level. Um, harvesting bark, um, I was relating it earlier, I believe I was talking about, you know, um, it's, if you don't know what you're going out there to get, it's like going into a grocery store and shopping for an ingredient that you've never even tasted. So how are you to know what you're looking for? What size are you looking for? What, um, you know, size weavers are you going to want to have? What size warps are you going to want to have? Do you know the difference between red and yellow cedar bark and how to process it? Uh, the first time that I went harvesting was actually after a full winter of classes at the Totem Heritage Center. And um, I was very grateful for the knowledge that I already had about what I, what I thought that I wanted. Uh, but then the following year, after another winter of classes, my mind had changed. And I was able to still, you know, use the material that I had, you know, um, harvested the year previously. However, I, I just, I changed my mind on, you know, how I wanted my cedar bark to look, how I wanted it to go through the tools and make the fine, pretty uniform strips. So while it is important, I believe, for weavers to eventually learn about the harvesting and processing, I wouldn't say it's necessarily um, necessary <laughs> for everybody to harvest and process all their own. If you are honoring who had gotten that bark for you, then, you know, that's a wonderful, beautiful thing. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to point out is that, um, you know, when teachers, um, when teachers are generous with their bark, you need to understand that, um, you know, if you, let's say in all the time that it took you to make a basket, at least double that amount of time was spent on just processing and harvesting the material. So really is that basket yours or is it something that is yours and your teachers? So if you'd really like to put yourself out there and say that I'm a weaver and I you know, make baskets, I make hats, I make mats, I make ropes, any of any or all of the above, um, really think about where your material is coming from. Thank you very much for that answer. I'm gonna take 
the chance to say if you're just tuning in, we're talking with Stacey Williams discussing her weaving and the different types and styles of Northwest Coast weaving. If you have questions, please type them in the comments and I'll read them off. In just a moment, I'm also going to be adding in some links. SHI has started construction of its art campus in the downtown Juneau, which will expand opportunities for education and art. If you're interested in making a donation to the arts campus, please visit the link I'm about to put into the chat. We are also still accepting virtual artists and residents applications for the upcoming months. If you'd like to be featured, please apply. You can apply at the link I'll provide in the chat. And Stacy has her own website where you can view her work, which I'll also link into the chat. In just one moment. While I'm doing that, Stacy, uh, do you have any other baskets you'd like to show us? Let's see. Um, I think I showed you most of the ones that I have right here in front of me. There is this one, um, I guess it's another type of sampler, but you can see it's very short. Um, really what I was working on here was the size of my weavers is comparatively, um, that is a lot smaller than that size of weaver. And so I was getting a feel for, do I want to work with dental floss? Do I want to work with something that's about the width of a pencil? What am I going for? What I was also doing was practicing the twined bottoms. Um, and so I just did this little start. I didn't really measure my warps. And so it ended up being a very small piece, um, but something that I'm still proud of as part of what, um, what it takes to go on the journey of weaving. You know, you need to practice, practice, practice. I saw on one of the Cedar um, uh, groups on Facebook, um, somebody had recommended uh, doing starts one, one to three times a day for an entire month before it will really solidify into your brain what it is that you're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, it's really important to, to think about that, I think. Um, another little just small fun thing that I made, um, and I believe this is available in a better photo on the website, uh, is I did this uh, little um, bracelet um, with a little flower on it. So I'll just kind of hold that up to the camera a little bit. And it's got a, um, a diagonally plated band. Um, so that was a lot of fun. That was just some contemporary piece that I felt like working on and my fingers just kept busy for a while. Uh, so that's how that went. Um, last week, I believe that this one was a pretty big hit, so I'll bring it up again, but the, uh, the, little, the little guy uh, with the, the false embroidery. Um, so this was the first miniature basket that I did, but also the first time that I used the false embroidery technique. Now, if you have any basic knowledge about weaving, understand that there is the two strands that go back and forth. Well, false embroidery wraps around the the front side of the weaver, but not the back side. So if you look in, I don't think you can really see in, um, but there's no purple on the inside. It just looks like weaving. So that false embroider is really just done on the outside. Um, I believe I use tweezers and a very small needle to try to um, make that nice and tight. Uh, but again, just a, a project that I'm, that I'm fairly proud of um, that I like to just, I just like to look at it sometimes. I really enjoy looking at it. So thank you for showing us again. Um, our next question for the latter half here is, uh, what is the most relaxing thing that you create? Oh, I think the most relaxing thing that I create is probably um, spinning warp, uh, boiled cedar cordage, chill cat warp, raven's tail wool. It's a mostly mindless activity and the payout is great. Uh, you know, to be able to, create um, a piece and say, I spun all of the warp, I did all of the twining, that's something really special, you know, especially within Chill Cat, um, that in the class that I had taken with Dorica Jackson, um, and that I was able to create uh, two sides of a pouch that are almost ready to be put together, <laughs> just about. Um, but I was able to say that, you know, I harvested my own yellow cedar, I boiled it myself and I spun it into warp and hung it on my loom. And so I was really proud to be able to say that, but also I don't think that spinning is the hardest thing in the world. Some people can't stand it and they think it's tedious, um, but also, you know, some people would think that something like this is pretty tedious. Uh, so, you know, it just, it depends on what your, what your interests are in. Um, but I definitely enjoy just sitting on the couch or on the floor or something and spinning away. Uh, what I will say for spinning is that um, 
it can be really hard on your thighs um, because you do spin it on, um, usually bare thigh is the best. So, you know, you can wear a skirt or shorts or whatever, um, but it will definitely make your skin a little bit red and raw at first. Uh, so if that is you, um, I might suggest getting a leather leg guard, which can very simply be made by cutting out a very strong, um, thick piece of leather uh, like, you know, let's just say elk hide, um, punch some holes into it and just wrap it around your leg and string it up. Very interesting. Nice, nice advice. Um, my next question is, what are some examples of different types of twining? Different examples of different types of twining. So for twining, um, there's really that two, two strand basic twining and um, the two strand basic twining is executed differently um, within you know the different um, the different cultures. So for clinket twining, um, your basket will be held right side up, and your two pieces will go back and forth. Um, for Haida style basketry, typically your basket is held upside down. And you again go back and forth with the with the two, um, with three way twining. Um, usually, it's used to separate or confine designs, and again, it's executed in in several different ways. The way that you do a three way twine and clink it will be different than how you do it in Haida. Will be different than how you do it in Zimchian. Um, you know, then there are braids, uh, you know, braiding on textiles, more specifically Chilkat, is done along with the basic twining. And it's done in such a way that you can have six different sets of braids varying in two to three strands each per set in the same spot. That's more than 20 strands to deal with at the same time. And remember that everything is balanced and symmetrical. So for every set of six braids, there is another set of six on the other side. That's a lot of math. <laughs> uh, do you find it difficult to keep the difference, the different types of twining separated? Well, sometimes uh, when I step away from a project for too long, uh, I do get stumped on how to get back into it. Uh, lately, I've been holding myself to more of a schedule and it, it, it seems to be going well, uh, but I do like to keep notes. And sometimes that is just as simple as keeping a picture of an example. Make sure you get high resolution photos of anything that you are studying, be it in a museum, be it in a gallery. If you're allowed to take a photo, make sure it's a good photo. You never know when you're gonna need a close up of that piece. If you happen to be gifted in drawings or diagram design, unlike me, uh, you might want to draw the stitch. Um, you know, with uh, form line design, I, um, I'll just say this, I know what I want my ovoid to look like, but my hands don't really hear the message. So there is that. So if you are gifted in drawing, take up weaving and start drawing out some of the diagrams. There are wonderful books with descriptions, but um, you never know who can't understand that particular diagram or needs a different picture. So, you know, I would say that that's something that's always needed. Very interesting. Nice cross between the different art styles. Uh, what is your schedule like? What is my schedule like? Well, I would say that, um, Sometimes it feels like I don't really get started until mid morning if I'm up late working on projects. I find that there are too many dis distractions during the day sometimes, uh, including my dogs who like to bark at everything in the new house. Uh, they're really small and they have so much energy and I'm, I'm really surprised that they haven't uh, been interrupting our time together. Um, but you know, I really like to say that at night, the world calms down. The messages stop coming, the emails stop pinging, at night, we weavers come out of our studios and into a creative zone. Uh, I would say that most of my pieces are completed in the quiet of the night. As a fellow artist, I absolutely agree that night is the best time for those inspirational juices to be running. Uh, tell me about some time constraints on processing your cedar or spruce root. Well, when harvesting cedar properly off of the tree, there is a window of opportunity. 
And that window includes, you know, harvesting in such a way that you are going to allow the tree to be able to heal itself after you're done harvesting from it. Um, I think that is of the utmost importance for weavers to understand is just because you can go and get a strip off the tree doesn't necessarily make you a harvester. And so it's really important to understand that there's so much more to it than just pulling a strip off of a tree. There's that connection to the tree, there's the connection to the forest, there's the connection to the, the final product. Um, you know, I even like to keep in mind what I'm going to be working on with that particular tree. You know, while working, I'll be like, oh, you, you know, this yellow cedar has a little bit of a twist in its grain, but it's still nice and long and straight. And so, well, you might be boiled and you might be spun, but you're going to be something beautiful in the end. For cedar, there's that, when I talk about the window of opportunity, I'm also really speaking to the very reality of mold. Um, you know, that is a big reality. Um, sometimes trees will still be willing to give their bark, but because it's so warm out or, you know, we've been having these crazy heat waves over the, over the summer, that bark can mold in its bag before you even get it back down to the house to process it. So really be mindful of what you're doing, how much you can do, where you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, um, and what is going to be the, the end result. Uh, for spruce roots, you really want them to maintain their original moisture as long as you can, again, without molding. So what you really need to do is um, put them in a clean sack. And then once you cook them in the fire, you know, they're still wet a little bit on the inside. So again, put them in a different clean sack and make sure you process as, as quick as possible. Um, something that I don't talk about um, as often, and I think is, a, is another reality for weavers, is that this work is hard on your body. You know, harvesting and processing, you know, that's hiking out in the woods for hours before you even come upon your tree. And then think about the work that you have to do at the tree and then the hike back out and then all the work in processing into the night. Um, when I first started harvesting, I was so happy, I was so ready, and I was so excited to just keep going. And I kept going for too long. And one thing that I, I don't talk about as much is that I actually have um, some low, low to mid levels of tendonitis in both of my wrists. And, um, you know, I have some, some damage to my hands and to my wrists from doing that constant work while processing. Um, I actually had to uh, go to um, physical therapy and get my, my hands and my wrists and stuff worked on. And um, the occupational therapist working with me told me, you need to stop weaving, not forever, but if you don't stop now, you, there may not be a forever for weaving. So take that into consideration. Breaks are important. Um, one of my teachers uh, really likes to instill a 20-20-20 rule. If you're working on something this close, you know, within that, that range, you really should be taking a break every 20 minutes to look away for 20 seconds somewhere 20 feet away. That's all it takes. But remember to do it. If you have to set an alarm, remember to do it. Because if you've been weaving for an hour, you are not going to be weaving tomorrow. That's what I'll tell you on that. That is great advice. Um, we have another comment question about materials. How long does it take for someone to get good at harvesting and preparing their own materials? And how does it show in the weaving if materials were not prepared correctly? Well, if materials were not prepared correctly, uh, it can show in the color of it, in that you have different, um, it'll almost look like a different dye lot, but you know, it's, it's cedar, it hasn't been dyed. But what will end up happening is that you have a variation of color. And that can be okay if that's what you're going for. The other thing will be in the thickness of your strips. Um, I'll go ahead and show an example here on this basket. Oh, I think I can find it right there. Um, so if you can see, there's kind of like this little line right in there. Yeah, there's that little line because I didn't process my material as I do now. There was a little bit of a thick spot somewhere and it didn't get thinned down enough. So that created a little ripple in my basket. So that's, that's an example right there for you to show. I'll just, but this was only like my third or fourth basket. So please be easy on me. 
Um, but that can that can be something that shows. So make sure you thin out your material evenly. If you can't get your material down to an even set all around, maybe you need to go one grade up. Maybe you just need to work with a little bit of thicker material, or maybe it was in the tree. You know, I would say that even after, I don't, I don't know, it's probably been four or five years of harvesting now, I am still trying to learn. I consider myself a lifelong learner along with many of my teachers and we're always trying to learn from each other. You know, I'll, I'll go next door and I'll say, hey, um, you know, this tree kind of went funny on me. Do you have any advice? And they're like, oh yeah, you know, this is what you do. And we'll go step by step. What is it that maybe I did wrong in selecting the tree, in starting the tree and pulling the actual strip? What I'll also recommend is um, support networks, support groups. Um, you know, sometimes there will be classes hosted on harvesting and processing. And while those can be great, I urge you to go to them cautiously. Um, one, you know, make sure you know what the teacher's credentials are for being able to harvest and process. Make sure you understand the organization's credentials for harvesting and processing. Um, if you don't have um, an idea of even where to begin, you know, there's great YouTube videos that have been put out by, um, I believe it was the uh, the Smithsonian Arctic Study Center um, here in Alaska, and you know, Dr. Dolores Churchill, she was in a series on, you know processing the cedar. While that is not going to replace a teacher right there next to you, it can start to give you an idea. So as far as research goes, I really like to study what I'm going to do for as long as I need to. You know, that can be a week, that can be several years, but study what you're going to do and make sure you know what you're trying to get out of it. That brings us to uh... One of our last questions, which is what books or resources do you recommend for someone studying basketry or Northwest Coast art? There are plenty of options in local bookstores throughout Southeast. So go and look at the, the Alaska section and look for Northwest Coast basketry. There are other books you can look up that are just on very simply the techniques of basketry. And once you get good at looking at Northwest Coast art, you can pick and choose and say, oh, that's actually how we do it here. And here's a diagram and now I can use it. Um, one book that I, that I really highly recommend is by um, Sharon Busby, I believe. Um, and um, I'm happy to go put back and put a comment in later after this video is over. Um, but she did um, Spruce Root Basketry of the Haida and the Clinket. And that was one of the books I was talking about, I believe um, in at one of these questions <laughs> um, about full sized photos of of the pieces. And you can really go in and study what's going on there. There's also a small, um, it almost looks like a booklet and it's really, you can miss it very easily if it's just on a shelf. Uh, you can also order it um, probably on Amazon or Aid Books or Thrift Books or wherever it is that you get your books. Um, but there's a spruce root um, basketry tech techniques. And that one really has details about different forms of twining. And so that's truly wonderful. As always, um, you know, almost every Northwest Coast artist that I know will refer back to Bill Holm and his 50th anniversary edition of the analysis of form. That's a wonderful place to start into Northwest Coast art and to understanding um, this culture and, and where it comes from. Um, there's plenty of other books. And um, one place I will recommend is I believe that uh, Ketchikan Museums, the Tongass Historical Museum and the Totem Heritage Center here locally do have a recommended reading list um, that while I was there, I participated in trying to, you know, make sure that that list was updated. Um, so give them a call, ask them for some recommendations as well and call your local museum and, and see what they have going on as well. So. Go museums, you know, they're really, really great resources. I agree, thank you very much. Uh, the final question for this afternoon is, what do, you, what do you recommend for students starting out and for lifelong learners? What do I recommend for a student starting out? Well, always look for the opportunity to learn. You know, if you don't see any, create one. You know, you can find a book to research. You can find a museum to research with like we were just talking about, but always find those opportunities to learn. And for those lifelong learners, 
Don't forget to create opportunities for others to learn, to share one's knowledge. I think that is of one of the highest callings that you can have. I absolutely agree. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you again, Stacy, for answering our questions. The rest of the videos in this series will be available on YouTube on the Alaska Heritage Institute channel later. Have a good evening.